Hello, cubicle crashers. Happy good morning. Happy Thursday, sorry. <laughs> good morning from Bali, everyone. Uh, I just got back from uh, a great two-week holiday in Thailand, and uh, my tan is fading, fast fading in the rainy weather of the tropical um, paradise that is of Bali. We're in rainy season right now, but I did catch some rays of sunshine while I was on holiday in Thailand. Um, but I'm back in the office uh, and excited to start our new month in December here uh, with our um, usual Q&A day, uh, which happens every uh, first week of every month. It's something that we've been doing in the last quarter uh, to really... Um, Help me get to know some of your burning questions. Thank you, everyone, for submitting uh, your burning questions for Q&A week every single month. Uh, it really allows me to deep dive and give you some great mentorship uh, some free coaching and advice uh, for some of the things that might be obstacles for you or stuck points for you when it comes to uh, launching an independent business, working your way into planning your transition from your corporate gig, or really any questions that are about big changes. You know, uh, a big thing that I uh, love talking about is always about how uh, we can support you to make big changes in your life in other ways of transformations, not just your corporate transition from your nine to five job. Uh, but also a lot around lifestyle changes, things that you no longer find meaningful to do anymore or spend time doing or invest energy uh, in doing anymore. You know, it's not an easy thing to make big changes in your life. So uh, these sorts of topics about how to go through change and how to go through transition uh, are also topics that I love to jam about. Uh, so if you're watching us live here, uh, uh, I do the Q&A sessions, every, as I said, every first week of every month uh, on our Facebook page. So you're very likely, if you're watching this live, you're on our Facebook page. But we also republish this video to make sure that the content is being shared and, you know, whoever's watching in all our different social platforms. Uh, whoa, there's literally an earthquake happening right now. <laughs> I don't know if you can see my screen shaking, but my entire house just literally, can you see the back there of my bookshelf just having a little <laughs> moment there? We've just had a little tremor, which is, by the way, very common uh, in Bali. We're in the ring of fire, but that's kind of cool that it's happened on a live stream. Uh, usually it happens in the middle of the night and my bed starts to shake and I feel like I'm the, in an exorcist bedroom or something. But this time it's actually happening in the day and while I'm on the live stream, which is brilliant. Um, Sorry for the little interlude there. Um, so as I was saying, we uh, broadcast these once a week. Uh, it's live if, It's live on our Facebook page. If you're watching this live, say hello to us here. Say hello to me uh, while you're watching this. But we also republish it into our other channels. Uh, so uh, I have a YouTube video channel that you'll, if you're seeing it from there uh, as a replay, uh, don't forget to click on the link that we provide at the bottom of the description or in this Facebook post here, if you're watching it on Facebook, uh, to be uh, to like our Facebook page so that you're notified of all our monthly free trainings and free Q&A sessions that I run every single month. Uh, there's two main things that we do on our page, uh, including all the free stuff that we always give away every week. Uh, but we do a Q&A uh, on uh, the first week of every month, right, as we mentioned, and and then actually in the middle of the month, we also do free trainings uh, that helps you to start a side hustle, helps you to prepare uh, your mindset, your financial positions, your relationships, your uh, life really to um, for corporate transition. We talk a lot about those topics. Uh, and we also talk a lot about uh, in the trainings around repurposing your expertise and starting businesses uh, as a new entrepreneur and how you find your first clients, how you launch your first offer, how you market yourself as an independent solopreneur. We cover all those different types of topics every single month based on your demand uh, on what it is that you want to learn. Uh, so that's offered um, for free as well on our Facebook page. So again, don't forget to like our Facebook page in order to always be in the know of all our free stuff that we offer to you and to our community uh, every single month. Okay, well, let's get started on today's Q&A. There's two big questions uh, that was uh, submitted to us that I think are great questions to answer today. Uh, and so we'll start with the first one that comes from Allison. Let me just put a question up here 
on the screen. Uh, so Allison um, asked a question of finding new clients. Uh, a really, again, common question on people that's, uh, you know, just started a service-based business, um, don't have a client roster yet, may not have an audience list yet. Uh, so this is a really common question that is usually um, uh, being asked by new entrepreneurs and a very logical question to obviously um, you know, that you need to know about, right? In order to make an income and replace your current salary to be able to be a full-time business owner. Uh, so Allison's uh, question is, what strategy can you advise me on to find clients for my new business? Uh, she says, I get very lost in the Facebook groups and would like some tips on getting clients digitally. So Allison, thank you very much for this question. Uh, and you know, Facebook groups a long time ago when I first started my first coach, uh, my, my first business and then my coaching business, uh, Facebook groups were actually one of the primary ways for me to get exposure, uh, to get noticed and to actually be able to find colleagues and other mentors and, you know, like-minded people that were starting businesses just like me. Um, now, you know, Facebook groups have changed a lot since my days six years ago when I started participating in them. Now, they certainly are a resource and a place digitally, a platform, right, that you can find clients in. I definitely find some of my first few clients in Facebook groups. Um, but if uh, I was to advise today on what it's like to use Facebook groups, I can say that actually, you know, some groups are great, especially if it's groups that are well curated and um, they've got some good guidelines and structure about how that page is being managed. It's not sort of a spam zone of Facebook groups where things just get lost in the way. Um, it really depends on the Facebook groups that you're in, but generally, I believe Facebook groups are starting to get quite saturated. Um, they are filled with a lot of people that only actually want to spam and actually promote their th offers and their, you know, newest blogs and so forth. And uh, it becomes less of sometimes a helpful place uh, for people to get get information or be connected to the right mentors. And also sometimes the rules for certain Facebook groups um, are quite strict, you know, because and and so it should be, you know, promotion days being maybe once a week. Uh, and other days being more supportive posts and helpful posts. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I agree with that. I have, I have a Facebook group myself called The Unconventionalist that, you know, if we allow people to promote services all day, every day, it then becomes a really um, ad filled group rather than a supportive uh, and community minded group. Right. So I wouldn't suggest for Facebook groups to be the only place for you to find clients, even though I do believe Facebook groups are a great way to share um, advice and actually practice sharing your expertise and start being known by sharing things without the conditions of selling anything, right? Those are, those are really great platforms to showcase, um, you know, knowledge that you have to be able to give advice to people, to answer things like a Q&A session uh, and to start actually getting to know uh, a like-minded community of people that might potentially be clients in the future. But the intention for those groups uh, may very well to help you to just connect you with peers and colleagues and potential clients in the future. But, you know, I would really more use it as a practice ground to give away information, give away advice, maybe search for questions on there or ask your own questions on there but I wouldn't primarily use it as a sales channel. Um, I think actually a lot of uh, more effective ways to actually find your first few clients, and this is really historically what's happened for me, for a lot of my clients that I've coached uh, in the past, is we always disregard um, a lot of our inner circle and our current networks of people right, that we've already accumulated along the way in our lives so far, right? We always look sort of like in digital formats, like, you know, Facebook groups and maybe using ads to find clients right away. But I don't believe that's usually the best way, to be honest, to find clients. Um, I find that in our lives, whether it's in our physical communities or even in our LinkedIn profiles or a personal Facebook profile, we've actually um, have already accumulated a lot of social contacts, right, in the time that we've been um, networking in our professional lives to right people we meet on the road or while we're traveling uh, or in coffee shops every single day. So this inner circle and this ecosystem of community already exist within your life. And a lot of times we disregard these people who we've already built a lot of social equity with, right? They're not strangers to us as a person, we may have already built a lot of trust and credibility, right? And, and connection with and authentic connections with in the past, however many years we've known these people. And they're actually some of our best supporters, 
the best people to tap into to get referrals, uh, and the best people that probably should know about the new uh, field of work or a passion project that we're starting. But we don't say anything to some of our personal friends and our family right away, but instead we do things like, you know, tell strangers in Facebook groups um, about our newfound passion for a project we're working on. Um, so I encourage you to actually don't forget about friends, family, relatives, colleagues, uh, people that belong into your associations of clubs and memberships you're a part of, uh, your churches that you belong to, um, and other organizations and associations you're already collaborating with. Very likely, this is a better place to start finding clients and start offering support and start actually getting partnership and collaborations through these channels that you can be making a list of or finding leads through versus actually going through cold lead platforms like Facebook groups. You know, my uh, coach Pam Slim calls this uh, this watering holes, right? What are some of your watering holes you're already associated with? And if you take a bit of a pause, Allison, to really think about people you already know, right? Like-minded people that um, you don't have to convince them that you're someone to be trusted, right? You've had social equity built with them already. Where can you start actually pitching your services or pitching um, you know, supportive uh, experiences like workshops uh, or free seminars or, um, you know, gathering a meetup together uh, that can allow you to actually give away some of your expertise as a bit of a funnel, right, to, 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 um, help people see what you're you're an expert about, uh, be able to help unconditionally, help authentically and genuinely. And then from that process, you're going to start to get inquiries if people are interested in your work on how to work with you and, 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 and know further, right, about the offers that you may have, right? So it feels less of a sales pitch uh, and a pitching fest and more around giving away really valuable information, you know, um, giving away great advice to people and in a circle of people that actually you need your help and then allowing that authenticity and relationship building through things like giving away right workshops and resources and then inviting people to speak to you uh, if they would like right more support and more help around that uh, this really worked well for me when I was starting out as, as a first-time coach back in the day you know um, I used to join uh, women entrepreneurship groups and meetups in Vancouver where I'm from uh, and I would go and talk to you know the meetup founder or I would go to talk to the co-working space that you know would host our Friday meetings or Friday conferences for all of us new entrepreneurs and I would suggest like you know I would love to talk a little bit about um, you know starting a side hustle or transitioning from corporate or all the things that I've learned uh, around being a freelancer and how to get that started as a side hustle. Um, <clears throat> and all you have to do is really ask how you can collaborate, how you can give value, you know, to the space, the venue, or the group that they've already started. And very likely people are always happy to help. And, and if they're getting something uh, that's complimentary, something that's a no-brainer for their audience as well, and it's super helpful uh, for their audience, um, People would love to always love these collaborators. So, uh, but you would have to, you know, learn to, to learn to actually ask for that and, and learn to collaborate, uh, with, uh, um, you know, organizations and groups like that. Uh, but just as, you know, Pam Slim, my coach mentions, like, think about your watering holes. Think about the associations and people that you already know that can either be supporters, share your work, or have access to an audience, right? Or a community, uh, that is, uh, going to help lead Lead you to start sharing your work uh, and are a great uh, profile of an audience uh, that is in alignment right with your ideal customers and people that you truly want to help so Allison depending on your business right um, let's say you know I was just talking to actually a coaching client of mine yesterday who was a career you know uh, about to embark on on her new project as a career coach right uh, and her old history of employment used to be in universities she sort of, sort of worked with college students and uh, work in that industry you know and uh, one of the collaborations that we sort of thought about which was easy low-hanging fruit for her to tap into uh, was going back into you know getting a hold of some of these university contacts right all the other career counselors that she does know in universities or the young adult nights that uh, certain people host and run or parent teacher nights, right, that uh, she already know a lot about these events that are already happening, right, in these universities, um, how can she actually tap into, right, those resources she already is, are, are, is familiar with and actually start to cross-collaborate, offer this, you know, 
new expertise that she she wants to share uh, through these old contacts, right, that already know her, that already trust her, that already have built social equity with her in the past. And that seems a lot, you know, easier for her to start doing some of these workshops, start helping university students to find their career path outside of university, for example, right, then going into Facebook groups and trying to pitch herself as a career coach for young adults, right? Um, in those groups that people that don't know her. So that's a great example of using it, using an existing watering hole to do that. Um, and lastly, you know, um, what concept also comes to mind is uh, something that Tara Gentili from Co Commercial has uh, mentioned that I really loved from a few years ago when I was going through testing out different offers in my business. Uh, and Tara always t uh, calls this the living room strategy. Uh, it's something like gathering, you know, a small group of people to test things with, to test out, you know, um, ways of marketing or ways of an offer or offering an offer for the first time, or simply actually just gathering people together uh, and actually finding a uh, building great relationships through smaller groups. Right. So instead of actually trying to market to, you know, a 5000 person Facebook group. Right. Uh, you are actually handpicking, you know, women or particular uh, types of people in your community that fits your ideal customer profile and actually hosting events in your living room. Right. Literally. Um, so that feels intimate. It feels personal. Um, it's something that's easy to do, right? Gathering six to 10 people in a small meetup, having a, like a wine and cheese night to be able to share things uh, around coaching, around nutrition, if that's your business, uh, or gathering, right? Awesome speakers together and, and hosting a speaking circle, right? Once a month, right? Those are great marketing activities to focus on and build intimacy and relationships with right in some with your audience then sometimes going into these larger thousand people facebook groups so allison hopefully that was uh helpful for you uh to start thinking about watering holes your existing ecosystems and tapping right into groups and communities that you've already built social equity with to do things like the living room strategy and to be able to perform a much more intimate way of um, inviting people to work with you inviting people to collaborate and run workshops with you versus getting lost right in the sea of facebook groups that you mentioned um, let me know allison if you're watching uh if you have any questions and i'll be happy to answer that in the comments uh when you watch the replay thanks for that question all right. The last question of the day comes from uh, Trevor uh, and Trevor asks, uh, how do I move forward with my passion project when I feel like I care too much and I can't seem to get over my perfectionism? Um, I feel the same way, Trevor. I'm quite a type A perfectionist myself. Um, I can sometimes fall into high anxiety whenever I don't get things done on time or feel that I've done things perfectly. And to be honest, I'm really shit with failing. You know, whenever I feel like I have failed or I didn't get something done in a standard or quality that I've anticipated for myself, I get pretty hard on myself. And that itself uh, prevents me from sometimes moving forward quicker. Uh, or just to be honest, um, you know, gives me a lot of angst <laughs> whenever I do something new. Uh, and that perfectionism, that high, uh, you know, being hard on myself sort of attitude isn't always conducive for, um, you know, us to uh, try new things and to be challenged to actually uh, ship things out there imperfectly, which is so what's necessary in the world of entrepreneurship. So know that you're not alone, Trevor, um, in this problem. Um, now, you know, the first thing I would like to say about, you know, perfectionism and sort of giving do giving a lot of shit right about your passion project is a good thing actually Trevor I think that means that you care a lot about the thing that you're about to produce and create um, it really uh, you know showcases that you have a trait that um, uh, allows you to, to know that you, you want to give high quality experiences, right? To produce high quality things to your customers or, you know, for the audience of your project. And that's a good thing, right? There's, I think that's more necessary sometimes, um, in the world we live in where there's like tons of people just producing things half assed, you know, and half heartedly just to put things out there and do things and hack their way into success. You know, the world needs more people like you that actually care about their work that feels more meaningful when they produce high quality work. Right. And the only thing to really be mindful of is sort of when that high quality, you know, um, perfectionism monkey brain sort of comes into effect and it prevents you from actually putting your work out there, which then becomes completely invaluable to yourself and other people because no one gets to see your passion, right? And that isn't helpful, of course, to yourself and your purpose and then right to the people that you want to serve. Uh, but don't be hard on yourself by being 
for being a perfectionism, just know how to manage that. You don't have that high quality character that you've got, but you know, in a balance that allows you to still put things out there imperfectly and fix things as you go. So you can still be high quality and high standard. It doesn't mean that just because you put things out there imperfectly means that you're half assing your passion project. What it means is that you're putting things out there in the intention to actually make changes and improve things. And that's excellent for a high quality person like you, uh, which, me which means that you just have to tell yourself a new story that every time you put things out there that aren't perfect and it allows you to make good changes and positive changes to doing it again, just know Trevor that you have every opportunity to keep putting things out there all the time, right? It's not the one time chance you've got. Uh, and it's, it's a limiting belief sometimes that we have uh, as perfectionist people that we think we only have this one chance to make it right. And that's it. And if we don't do it, you know, we never live it down. It's not true. The, the truth of the matter is that you can put things out there over and over again, be better at what you do in your work and your craft. And people will actually value that a lot more than actually not hearing from you ever and only hearing from things uh, uh, during times that you're perfect. Right. Um, but with perfectionist people like you and I, Trevor, uh, the best thing that I can always advise on is really start to craft smaller goals. Um, I find that as a perfectionist, um, whenever I have way too big of goals or goals that feel like it'll take six months to a year to realize uh, my motivation level uh, is really um uh, it's very hindered, right? I, I need to feel wins faster. And I think whether you're a perfectionist or not, uh, motivation relies on you getting smaller wins, right? Being able to get to wins faster, to know that you're creating progress, to know that there's traction, and that's going to allow you to want to keep going, right? But with perfectionists, it's very by default in our behavior to have big goals and to have these really long-term goals uh, because we think big, right? But unfortunately, it really triggers our perfectionism ten tendencies uh, and holds us back because we tend to not celebrate, right, uh, until the big goal is met. And also, we feel very overwhelmed at times when the goals feel very big. So we do have to chunk down these goals. And the way that I always teach my coaching clients to sort of look at goals is, yes, we want to dream bigger to what might happen in a year's time, what we're working towards, but what's really the urgent thing to keep attention to and focus on and really create bigger action on is always about these bite-sized goals that what, what I would define as uh, uh, better as milestones, right? So working on things like a 90 day plan rather than a 12 month plan is always easier for people with perfectionism, Trevor, and also right. Chunking those down into monthly milestones out of those, the big 90 day plan, right. And knowing that you have one big goal to meet every month that can lead you to right a bigger goal at the end of 90 days and then so forth into a year. That's going to help you focus more on one thing at a time, right? With perfectionism, uh, you know, having too many things to work on or too many big projects on the go or too many big goals on the go, that's what really overwhelms people with perfectionism tendency. So having a milestone, right, sort of uh, outlook rather than big goals and then chunking those things down to bite sized action. So let's say one of your milestones to meet for your passion project is to do market research and interview an audience on an offer or a product that you're looking to design. OK, let's just say that's an example. And that could be your milestone for month one. But when you chunk down the bite sized action, then you're looking at what may need to happen from week one to four in order for you to um, complete that first milestone. And you're going to really make those bite sized actions literally one, you know, one step at a time. And you're focusing on time blocking those one thing, one step at a time, you know, actions so that you're accountable for completing those bite sized actions before you move on to other things. So one of the things to combat perfectionism and the overwhelm, right, of doing too many things as a perfectionist is to actually focus on one thing at a time. And that's why I really like the idea of the Pomodoro technique where, right, you put on a timer or egg timer, right, or Pomodoro, those tomato timers that you see in the kitchen, where you're doing things in 20 or 25 minute increments. Uh, of time, right? And you're only focused on one thing. Like literally, it only will take you 25 minutes to complete this one thing. You don't turn on anything else. You don't open any more tabs. You don't, you know, multitask in any way. And you really focus on sprinting, right? Utilizing that 25 minute block of time to complete one thing at a time. And that practice isn't easy 
for a lot of perfectionists like you and I, Trevor, right? Where we like to multitask, where we like to overwhelm ourselves with, or we feel productive by doing many, many things at once is not an easy practice to have. But I tell you, uh, as you sort of cultivate and nurture this habit, in about 30 days, if you do this more often, right, putting a timer on, doing one thing at a time and not moving on until you've completed it, you're going to feel a lot closer to your passion project being launched or started without that perfectionism getting into in, 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 in the way, right? Or that overwhelm of doing too many things going in the way. And the last thing, Trevor, of advice that I would love to give you about moving forward with your passion project when you feel like you care too much is to treat things like an experiment, right? Get that notion out of your head that you only have this one chance to make it and this one chance to put things out there. Know that actually no one notices even things that you fumble on or things that you quote unquote fail on only us, right? The person actually doing the thing cares a lot, right? And that's why it just sort of feels more daunting and more urgent uh, than it really is in reality. Um, the truth of the matter is that there's so many opportunities to change things, just as I mentioned in the beginning uh, of your question, Trevor, right? But if you treat everything like an experiment that, you know, you're not um, holding on to uh, the fact that you can't fail, right? But where you allow yourself to actually um, make mistakes, right? Where you can actually look at mistakes as just a, a way to gain insight and information to improve and do things better. And again, this isn't going to be easy to start with as a perfectionist, but it's something that we can, it's a habit and a discipline that we can absolutely put into play uh, that will feel less uh, of a difficult thing to do when we do it more than once. Now, I still struggle a lot with perfectionism being the type of character that I am, right? The pros of it is that I, I, I love deep diving into things and, right? producing high quality stuff, but um, I know that it can hold me back professionally and per personally uh, because I can tend to overthink, right? So Trevor, I would encourage you to, when you put a piece of your project out there, right? Or a piece of the, the puzzle piece, right? To launch your passion project. Um, always think about, you know, is how can you go with good enough? How can you go with just, this is my best work at the best capacity that I know to do right now. And because it's my best work and it's good enough, that is good enough to put out there. And know that if it's a blog or an article, whatever it is that you think is the thing, right, that you're holding on to without pressing the publish button, um, know that you can publish it and make changes after. If you get a comment from a reader, you know, that tells you that, hey, I would love for you to talk more about that thing, or I didn't get it when you say it this way, hey, you have every right to edit that article, to reply to that commenter, to actually even use insight and feedback from someone's um, review, right, of something you've written and produce a second blog or a reply, right, or a video or something that actually allows you to do even more uh, with your content in the future. So do things, just get started in giving yourself that challenge that every week you're shipping one thing out for your project. It doesn't matter if it's perfect or not, you're just going to put it out there and just press publish, press send, pitch that email, whatever you have to do, just click that button, right? And do one thing that makes that puzzle, one puzzle piece of your passion project to be out there, right? That's a beyond your control and your only responsibility is to put it out there. And if you challenge yourself to end every week, right? With just shipping one thing out there once a week or twice a week, you're going to find that you're going to get a lot more done, right? In a shorter amount of time. And the most important thing is to feel validation, right? And get evidence for whether changes needs to happen for your passion project or reviews or feedback, right? That gives you, um, yeah, that, that confidence to know that you're on the right track by putting it out there to an audience to give you that feedback. That's going to be a lot more helpful than actually hiding behind your laptop, you know, uh, and not letting anyone see parts of your passion project. Go with good enough because good enough is good enough. Thanks, Trevor, for that question. All right. Well, that is the end of our Q&A for December. I know that everyone's getting super busy, getting ready for the holidays, for Christmas time. Um, but I would love to hear from you. If anything from this Q&A session resonated with you today, uh, please leave me a comment uh, underneath this video. And I would love to hear from you. And I would love to know what questions you might have for next month's Q&A session. Um, 
as we start a new year, it's 2019 coming up in less than 30 days. Um, how would you like to start your new year on the right foot? What big goals, big plans that you would love uh, to uh, go towards and, 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 and start planning out for the new year, whether it's about your career, whether it's about lifestyle changes, what are those things? And how can I help you with the January Q&A month of helping you move forward with your goals. What questions do you have about goal planning? Uh, what burning questions do you have about, about going through change or making up big goals for your new year? Uh, let me know how I can support you and be of service to you. And I'll be happy to answer some of your questions in on next month's Q&A. Um, and later on this month as well, we'll be publishing my end of year recap. I learn a lot in a year uh, and I like to ch uh, really be sharing some of my life changing lessons that I've experienced that I think uh, is really relevant to everyone that's either going through entrepreneurship or any life change in general. Uh, there's lots of things that, that has been brewing in my mind is things that I've been um, actually been um, brewing and thinking about and, and and simmering in as I was on holiday for the last two weeks that I've been thinking about in my, uh, my, my next video blog post that I'm so excited to share with you to end our year together. Um, and I look forward uh, to hearing how we can support you uh, in the free stuff that we do here on the page, whether it's questions we can answer, new trainings we can produce for you, uh, any comments and feedback uh, that uh, you can give us is always really, really appreciated. Um, have a great rest of your week. Have a good start to your first week of December. And looking forward to seeing you in our next Q&A session in January. See you later. Bye.